All right, there's just one more gap for Connie to cross. We have a plank and a step to attach it to. For the plank to drop down, we'll need it to pivot like a hinge, which means we'll need to use a bolt connector this time. Go into the connector section in the assembly menu. Select the icon with the nut on it. That's the bolt connector. Now you can connect it just like you did with the string and the piston. And because I'm so nice, I've placed some yellow and blue dots and a sneaky new purple one so that you can see where to make the connections. They're quite close together this time, so move in closer for a good view. Remember, you can use the grab cam on the R1 button to zoom in close. As always, connect the parent object first, the yellow dot. Then you can connect the child object, the blue dot. The grid snap will keep the bolt in a straight line so you don't have to worry about it. Once it's all connected, you can unequip the bolt connector using the circle button. You've probably noticed that there's a purple gizmo halfway along the bolt. That's the pivot which the bolt rotates around. Click R3 to see how it all works. Well, that's not right. It looks like we'll need to reposition the pivot to get the plank moving correctly. Click L3 to rewind time and reset the plank. Now go ahead and grab the purple gizmo with R2. Move it so it's by the purple dot. While you're grabbing the pivot gizmo with R2, press triangle to align it to the grid. Now grab it with L2 and use the sticks to rotate it so its axis goes through the bottom of the plank. The grid snap guide will help you line it up exactly. The child object, in this case the plank, will rotate around that axis. Once it's all lined up, switch over to play mode to test it out. If you've done it correctly, the plank should balance upright. Connie will need to push the plank down, unless, of course, the plank isn't long enough. Oh well, switch back to edit mode and rewind time. We'll sort out the plank in the next step. To make sure Connie can reach the last platform, we could always make the plank longer, but that's a completely different tutorial. Instead, let's try restricting the bolt's movement. We can do that by giving it an angle limit. First, you'll need to bring up the bolt's tweak menu. So hover over any part of the bolt, hold L1 and press square. You should see the Use Limits button about halfway down. Select it with X. And look at that. Three handles have appeared, two pale yellow ones and a longer pale blue one. The yellow ones set the range of movement, which is represented by the transparent arc between them. We need to move one of these yellow handles so it's just a little bit left of vertical. It should look like an 11 o'clock position. Now move the other yellow handle to a 3 o'clock position. If your handle doesn't line up exactly, just press triangle while you're grabbing it. This will realign the handle to the grid. The blue handle represents the position of the child object. So you need to line it up with the plank in the 12 o'clock position. Press triangle to realign the handle to the grid if necessary. You can close the tweak menu now and head into play mode to test the scene. If everything's working correctly, Connie should be able to reach Cuthbert. And if you feel like experimenting, you can try out some other connector types. See what you can come up with. 
Then, when you're done editing the scene, go through the door in play mode to finish this tutorial. Looks like Cuthbert is in a spot of bother. Connie needs our help to get across these platforms so she can rescue Cuthbert. So how about we add a little handmade animation to get her there? You don't need to go into play mode to see that Connie won't be able to make this jump. So let's animate that floating ledge down to her using an action recorder. Action recorders are super easy to use. Just stamp one in your scene, and it will record anything you move with the imp. And we mean anything. It'll even record you moving or tweaking gadgets. We'd better get going. Connie's getting really impatient. You know what cones are like. Go to the assembly menu. Press a square button if it's not already open. Then head to the animate menu. The animate icon is a clapperboard. That thing they use in movies before the director says, action. Now you get to be the director, and you can use these tools and gadgets to animate objects. Select the action recorder, the icon with a film strip and a plus sign on it. You'll now have an action recorder gadget on your imp. Stamp it down, somewhere near the floating ledge. A progress bar will appear at the top of the screen, along with a record button on the right. Also, your imp will turn red. This means you're ready to start recording. Don't worry, recording won't start until you begin moving or changing things. When you're ready, grab the floating ledge with R2. Move it slowly towards Connie using the motion sensor function or the sticks. You'll notice that the bar starts to fill, recording your every move. Don't worry, it's not a time limit. The bar fills up as a visual indicator of something being recorded, so take your time. When you let go of R2, the recording will pause. If you move your view or use the grab cam, that won't be recorded. But if you've started time with R3, Recording will continue when you let go of R2. That's why it's important to rewind or pause time before recording anything. That way, your action recorder only contains what you put into it. When you've finished recording, select the Stop Recording button in the Context menu. Or you can use the shortcut L1 and Circle button to exit the action recorder. Your imp will go back to normal to show that recording has stopped. 
Click R3 to play back your animation. Handmade animations are always a bit wobbly, but practice makes perfect. Calibrating your imp can help when using the motion sensor function. Just hold your controller in a comfortable position, then hold the options button for a few seconds. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit a recorded animation. Anything you record is stored in the Action Recorder gadget. If you hover over the floating ledge, the Action Recorder will pulse. Select the Action Recorder with X and dashed lines will appear on the objects animated with it. It'll also show the animation path, that's this dashed line. If you're not happy with your animation, redoing it is easy. First. Rewind time with L3. Then hover over the Action Recorder gadget, hold L1 and press X. Now we can start recording again. Select the Retake button in the context menu to replace the old animation. Now you can record a new one. Move the platform so it stops in front of Connie. You can undo actions you perform using the left directional button, but it won't undo any time that has passed. So it's better to use the retake button to undo animations. Move the floating ledge from the upper platform down to Connie. Don't worry if the animation's too slow or too fast, we can fix that later. Make sure you press the stop recording button when you're done. Spend a little time practicing with the action recorder. In the next step, I'll show you how to tweak your animation. Another way to edit animations is to tweak them. Hold L1 and press the square button over the Action Recorder gadget to open its Tweak menu. Here you can see all the tweaks for the Action Recorder. By default, the playback mode is set to loop, so it plays the animation over and over again. But you can set them to play once, sustain, or to ping pong. Once will play the whole animation just one time. Sustain will play the animation for as long as the action recorder has power. If it loses power, it will stop, then it will continue from that point when it's powered again. Ping Pong plays the animation forward once, and then plays it in reverse, then forward, then backwards, and so on. 
That sounds like a good option for our floating ledge. Select ping pong with X. Click R3 to start time and play the animation. You can also change the animation speed to make it slower or faster. Grab the slider with X and use your imp to change the speed. If you want to explore more of the action recorder tweaks, you can. If you hover over any button for a few seconds, a more info tip will explain what that tweak does. To close the tweak menu, just hold L1 and press the circle button anywhere over it. And of course, you can undo any changes you make by pressing the left directional button. Switch to play mode to test your changes. When you're ready, come back to edit mode and start the next step. Now that Connie's made it up to the higher platform, how will she get back down to the next one? First, rewind time with L3. You probably already know about cloning objects, but do you know that you can clone their animations along with them? I'm sure you remember how to clone, but if not, just hold L1 and grab the ledge you animated with R2. Once you've made the clone, Release L1, then move the ledge to the other side, and release R2 to place it. Not only did you clone the ledge, but you also cloned its animation. Click R3 to start time. Now we just need to flip it so that it moves in the correct direction. First, make sure you rewind time. Grab the platform with R2. Then click L3 to flip it horizontally. Depending on where you grabbed it, you might have to move it closer to the other platform after flipping. You may also need to realign it with triangle before releasing R2 to put it back down. Now click R3 to start time and the platform should move in opposite directions. Both animations are stored in the same action recorder. So if you retake or delete the action recorder, it will affect both animations. Now go into play mode and see if Connie can make it across both gaps. Switch back to edit mode when you're ready to move on. Now let's get Connie to Cuthbert and get them through the door before Cuthbert has a total meltdown. I've placed a shiny helper cube, let's call it Cuthbot, that holds up the next platform, but it's not very animated at the moment. To get it to walk back and forth towards the exit, we need to use Record Possession. It allows you to possess puppets and record a performance with them. Open the assembly menu, then go to the animate menu. Select Record Possession. It's the button with the sock puppet icon. Your imp can now possess the puppets in the scene. In the context menu, you'll see the count in button. When this is selected, you'll get a three second count in before recording starts. Press R2 over the cuffbot to possess the puppet and start the countdown.
When the count reaches zero, the possession recorder begins recording. Unlike the action recorder, it records constantly. So time will be recorded even when the cube isn't moving. Walk the Cuffbot around the obstacles to the final platform. Pause for a moment, turn around, then walk back to where the Cuffbot started. Starting and ending at the same place will help to make the animation loop smoothly. Press the circle button to depossess. You'll notice that the recording pauses when you depossess. Select Stop Recording in the context menu to exit the possession recorder. Once you've stopped recording, click L3 to rewind time, then R3 to start time and watch what you've recorded. In the last step, I'll show you how to edit the recorded possession. You may have noticed a possession recorder gadget has appeared next to the cuff bot. When you're using record possession, this gadget appears the moment you press the stop recording button. Select it with X to view the animation path. The possession recorder gadget also lets you edit and tweak the animation. Hold L1 and press X over the possession recorder to scope in and edit it. Just like the action recorder, you can choose to retake the animation by selecting the button in the context menu. To stop editing the possession recorder, select Stop Recording in the context menu. Or hold L1 and press the circle button to quickly scope out. You can also tweak the possession recorder with L1 and the square button. It has exactly the same options as the action recorder. Experiment with the recorder and the different tweak options. Remember, you can see more info about the tweak settings by hovering over them for a few seconds. Close the tweak menu by pressing L1 and the circle button anywhere over it. Once you're done editing, switch over to play mode to test out the completed scene. Then Connie can navigate to the last platform and help Cuthbert through the door to complete the tutorial.
You might be able to animate wobbly platforms with the action recorder, but keyframes are where animation gets serious. Nice try, Cuthbert, but leave the dream shaping to the experts. We're going to use keyframes to animate the platform so Connie can reach the exit. A keyframe records any changes you make to an object, such as its position, tweak menu settings, or anything else you can think of. Then it stores those changes in a gadget that you can switch on and off. OK, let's use keyframes to help Connie get across those platforms. First, go to the assembly menu. If it's closed, press the square button to open it. Look for the animate button, which has a clapperboard icon, and click on that. Start by selecting the keyframe gadget, which is the one with the diamond and the plus sign. Then stamp it in the scene above the first gap. You'll notice there's now a stop recording button in the context menu. And your imp now looks like a red keyframe. That means the keyframe gadget is recording any changes you make in the scene. But unlike the action recorder, it only records the state of things, not a period of time. It's probably easier to understand if we put it into practice. Let's try it on the block that's on the ground in front of Connie. Grab it with R2 and place it between the first two platforms. You'll see some dashed lines appear on the block. These tell you that the keyframe has recorded the change you've made to the object. You can move it as many times as you like. It'll only store the final result. If that's not the outcome you wanted, you can always undo your last change with the left directional button. The next bit is super important. To finish and store your changes in the keyframe, you need to select the Stop Recording button in the context menu. Select it now and see what happens. That's right, the block has snapped back to its original position. That's because the keyframe isn't active right now. But we can still see what's recorded by selecting the gadget with X. There, the block is back to where you moved it. You'll notice the keyframe doesn't record how things moved, just where they moved to. Make sure you deselect the keyframe before moving on. You can do that by pressing the circle button. In the next step, I'll show you how to use your keyframe in the scene. Now that you've recorded a keyframe, let's look at how to activate it. See the trigger zone above the first platform? Select it with X to check its area of effect. OK, it looks like the zone stretches across the whole gap. Deselect it with the circle button. Then use the sticks or the grab cam to move in closer to the gadget. You'll notice an output port on its side, labelled Detected. This sends a signal when it detects a possessed puppet like Connie. We need to connect this to the keyframe, so select the port with R2 or X to create a wire. Then stretch it to the keyframe gadget with your imp and use R2 or X to connect the wire to the power port. Now the trigger zone signal will switch on the keyframe when it detects Connie. Try it out in play mode. Just press the Options button and select the controller icon. See? As soon as Connie enters the trigger zone area, the block springs into place. Well, it works OK, but the animation's a bit fast, don't you think? We can do something about that after you take Connie across. Head back into edit mode. Rewind time with L3, and I'll show you how to add smoothing to the keyframe in the next step. OK then, we've made a simple keyframe animation. Now it's time to smooth it out and make it look better. 
Like almost everything in Dreams, keyframes can be tweaked. So open this one's tweak menu, hold L1, then press the square button over it. You'll see two sliders at the bottom, slow power up and slow power down. These determine how long it takes for the keyframe to turn on fully. Hover over the slow power up slider now and hold X. Then move your imp to the right to increase the value. Let's set it to one second for now. You can set slow power down to any value you like. Then close the tweak menu by selecting the cross icon in the corner. Or you can hold L1 over the menu, then press the circle button. Let's see what that looks like in play mode. Ah yes, that looks a lot smoother. If you're happy with the new animation, switch back to edit mode. Rewind time with L3 and move on to the next step. It looks like the bridge across the next gap has collapsed. We could just move it back into place, but where's the fun in that? Let's perform a little bit of magic instead. Go to the assembly menu and select another keyframe from the animate menu. Stamp it above the gap with R2 or X. Now see if you can reassemble the bridge. Grab the first part and move it back where it should be. One of the great things about keyframes is that they can affect multiple objects. So you can put the other half of the bridge back too. Then select Stop Recording from the Context menu to store your changes. Once recording stops, the bridge will go back to its original position. So, select the keyframe with X if you want to see those changes again. Hmm, I could have done a better job at positioning the bridge. Nothing to worry about though, because editing a keyframe is easy. Just select the Edit Keyframe button in the context menu. It's got the same icon as a keyframe gadget. This allows you to make changes to the keyframe. You can remove things from a keyframe by pressing the triangle button over them. And now the bridges are back on the ground. Let's put them back into place, but this time, make sure they're a bit straighter. Remember, when you're grabbing things, you can realign them by pressing the triangle button. There we go. Much better. You can select Stop Recording again to finish editing this keyframe. Then move on to the next step when your bridge is in place. The bridge's new position is already stored in the keyframe, so all we need now is a way to activate it. That's where this trigger zone will come in handy. Let's select it to see what zone it covers. Hmm, it's not in the gap this time, it's over this button. First, create a wire from the trigger zone's output using R2 or X. Then stretch it over to the keyframe and connect it to its power port. When Connie steps on the button now, the keyframe will be switched on. But what happens when she leaves the trigger zone? Let's test it in play mode to find out. Just as I thought, when Connie moves away, the keyframe switches off. Let's head back to edit mode and see what we can do about that. Of course, we could just move the trigger zone into the gap, but this is an animation tutorial. So let's see if we can use the keyframe's tweak menu to fix the problem.
Open it now with the L1 and square button shortcut and have a look at the options there. Hovering over the buttons will bring up their names. The one we're interested in is called Keep Changes. With this option turned on, any changes made by the animation will be permanent. So once Connie activates the keyframe, the bridge will stay in its new position until you rewind the scene. Since we're already in the tweak menu, let's add some smoothing to that animation. I think I'll set it to two seconds this time. OK, time to close the tweak menu with L1 and the circle button. Then try out these changes in play mode. How's that for a magic trick? You can switch back to edit mode, rewind time, and experiment with the keyframe to see what else you can do. Maybe you could try keyframing a tweak menu setting, or animating some elements from the tutorial collection. When you're done, move on to the next step, and I'll show you how to use keyframes on a timeline. Keyframes are great for making simple animations. But if you want to make something more complex, you need a timeline. See that little block floating between the last two platforms? Let's use keyframes on a timeline to animate it. Start by selecting a timeline from the Animate menu. Stamp it down somewhere around the last gap. Then you can use the circle button to unequip the gadget. Now open the timeline, hold L1 over it and press X. This is the timeline canvas. You can move the canvas with your imp by grabbing it with R2. The numbers along the top are seconds and you can see it set to 8 seconds by default. If you grab the edges with X, you can extend or shorten the canvas. Try setting it to around 6 seconds. If you ever need extra space to add more things, you can also extend the bottom of the timeline. Once you're comfortable with moving and resizing the timeline canvas, move on to the next step and we'll start adding things to it. Now, it's time to animate the floating block. Get a new keyframe from the Animate menu and stamp it in the scene. Now grab and move the block to its starting position at the edge of the platform where Cuthbert's waiting. Once the block's in place, remember to press the Stop Recording button in the Context menu. Now, grab the keyframe gadget and move it over the timeline. The gadget will snap to it. Place it at the very start of the timeline. Then get another keyframe from the Animate menu. We'll use this one to record the block's second position. This time, stamp the keyframe directly onto the timeline. Around the two second mark is good, on the same row as the first keyframe. Move the floating block to the opposite side of the gap. Now stop recording. Hover over the timeline canvas and play controls will appear. Using these controls, you can preview just the timeline without playing the rest of the scene. Select the play button to preview your animation. As you can see, gadgets are only active when the timeline's playhead is over them. So, when neither of the keyframes are switched on, the block goes right back to its original position. Now we need to edit the animation so the first keyframe blends into the second. To do that, open the first keyframe's tweak menu with L1 and the square button. Now that the keyframe is on a timeline, the buttons that were greyed out before 
are, are available. These are blend types and they change how one keyframe merges into the next. Select the linear button which will blend to the next keyframe at a constant speed. If you press the timeline's play button now, you'll see the platform move smoothly between the keyframed positions. Feel free to try out other blend types and see how they affect the animation. Then move on to the next step when you're ready. We've got the platform moving smoothly now, but we can still improve how it works. Let's begin by making it pause for a moment at the start and finish, so Connie has an easier time getting on. All we have to do is scale the keyframes on the timeline so they last longer. You might want to get up close to the first keyframe before we start. Now, with your imp over the keyframe, Hold the up directional button to extend it. Then do the same with the second keyframe. Now that the keyframes are longer, the blend has become quicker. You can see it for yourself by selecting the play button under the timeline. If you want to scale a keyframe more precisely, you can do that with its trim handles. Trim handles are the dotted lines at the beginning and end of keyframes. Grab them now with R2 to give it a try. We should get the platform back to where it started now, but instead of adding a new keyframe, we're going to clone the first one. You remember how to clone things, right? Just hold L1 and grab the first keyframe with R2. Now drag it past the second keyframe and place it by releasing R2. Now we just need to add the blending between the last two keyframes. Only this time we'll use a shortcut instead of the tweak menu. Just hover over the space between those keyframes, then hold L1 and press X. There you go, one linear blend added. You can even cycle through different blend types by keeping L1 held and pressing X again. I love shortcuts because I'm lazy. Use the play controls on the timeline to preview the animation. Move on to the final step when you're ready to continue.
Now, because there's some space at the end of the timeline where none of the keyframes are active, the platform just snaps right back to its original position. There's a few ways we could fix this. For example, we could shorten the timeline so there's no gap at the end. We could also lengthen the keyframe animation so it fills up the whole timeline. Or we could turn on Keep Changes in the last keyframes tweak menu. The last step is tweaking the timeline itself. So, hold L1 anywhere over it, then press the square button to see all of its properties. The playback speed makes it go faster or slower. But what we're interested in right now is the playback mode. When it's set to once, the whole timeline will play even if it was only powered for a split second. When it's set to sustain, it will only play when it has constant power. It will stop when it loses power, then resume from that point if it's turned on again. And if it's set to loop, it will repeat over and over as long as it has power. That sounds like the best option for this timeline, so select that one. Okay, it looks like we're good to go. You can close the timeline now by selecting the cross icon in the top right corner. Or you can hold L1 over the timeline itself, then press the circle button. Click L3 to rewind time and test out your changes in play mode. Once you're happy with everything, exit through the door to complete this tutorial. is your aura. Your creativity grows and evolves. Your aura will change to reflect your activities. You can become a specialist at one aspect of dreams or dabble in every area as you like. It can also help others find you so you can combine your talents and make something amazing together. When things don't sound the way they should, it can ruin the experience of playing. Don't worry, Cuthbert. The Dreamiverse contains heaps of ready-made sounds for us to use. First, let's switch over to play mode and see how it all sounds at the moment. Hmm, quiet, isn't it? Doesn't feel quite right. In fact, it's creeping me out, so let's head back into edit mode. Switch over to sound mode so we can start adding some sounds. Find the modes menu. It's inside the assembly menu. As you can see, there are lots of different modes. Each has its own set of tools for doing different things. We're currently in assembly mode. If you select the speaker symbol icon with X, 
will switch to sound mode. That's better. In the next step, we'll start adding sounds to the scene. OK, the first thing we need to do is to start adding some background sounds. See the button with the magnifying glass in the sound menu? That's the search menu. Select it now to view the different types of sounds you can add. Now select the speaker button to search for sound effects. This is the Dreamiverse, where you can find all the wonderful stuff other dreamers have made. I've already set aside a collection of sound effects for you in here. That's what this collection is. It's bursting with different sound effects for you to play with. Select it with X to open it. I've arranged the sound effects into groups for you. To get a proper overview, use the right stick to zoom in and out of the collection. This group of sound effects are background sounds. You can hear a preview of each sound by hovering over them with your imp. Find something that fits the dreamy atmosphere of the scene. I rather like dream space. When you've found a sound you like, select it with X. The sound you selected now appears as a gadget on your imp. You can stamp it into your scene with R2, any place you like. It doesn't matter where you put it because background sounds can be heard everywhere in a scene. Now let's start time with R3 and see how it all sounds. Ah, that's better. Notice how much more alive the scene feels with just that one sound. Imagine how it will feel with even more sound effects. But there's no need to imagine it. You can start adding more now to create a layered and unique ambience. If you want to replace a sound effect, just stamp a different one over it. When you've got things sounding just how you want them, rewind time with L3 and move on to the next step. Background sounds really help to create an immersive atmosphere. But to add sound to a specific object in the scene, you need to use what we call a spot sound. Let's try it out on the fire between the platforms. I'm sure we can find some fire sound effects in the collection. Let's take a look. Select search sound effects from the sound menu. As we open the tutorial collection in the last step, it's still open when we come back to the Dreamiverse. Isn't that handy? Ah, just what we need, some fire sound effects. Have a listen to some of the fire sounds and pick one you like. Once you've selected it, your imp will be equipped with a spot sound effect. See those rings coming off the gadget? That's the sound's fade zone. The rings show you how the sound fades away as you move further from the sword. Let's stamp that sound between the first two platforms. Put it above the fire and see what that sounds like. If you want to see the sound's fade zone, select the gadget with X. Click R3 to listen to the sound effect. You'll notice the sound gets louder the closer you get to it. Aha! You can almost feel that fire. Toasty. As you move away, out of the fade zone, it gets quieter. 
until eventually you can't hear it at all. You can press the circle button now to deselect the sound effect. Then click L3 to rewind the scene. If you're happy with your spot sound, move on to the next step. Things haven't been that tricky for Connie so far, but the next gap looks a bit too big, even with her mighty jumping skills. Let's fly over to that floating platform using the left and right sticks and get a closer look at it. Looks like there's a trigger zone attached to it. Why don't we switch over to play mode and see what it does. Well, will you look at that? It lights up the platform when Connie steps on it. Lovely. You know what would make it even better, though? If it made a sound as well. So let's switch back to edit mode and make that happen. I've got a feeling you can find something in the tutorial collection to use here. Go to the assembly menu and go back into sound mode. Now go to search and select search sound effects. Over here are some energy sound effects. Have a listen to a few. Pick a sound effect for your light up platform. I quite like the sound of Dream Terminal. See which one you like and select it with X. Now it's time to stamp it in the scene somewhere near the platform. In the next step, I'll show you how to trigger the sound effect. As we've already seen, background and spot sounds will play constantly when placed in the scene like this. But for the platform, we want the sound to be triggered by Connie. And for that to happen, we need to connect the sound effect to the same trigger zone that activates the glow. Move in closer to the platform using the left and right sticks. Take a good look at the trigger zone gadget. Do you see the output port that says detected when you hover over it? That means it will trigger when it detects a possessed puppet like Connie. So all we need to do to make the sound effect activate when Connie's on the platform is connect the output to the sound effect. Let's do that now. When you select the detected port with R2 or X, you'll see your imp becomes tethered to the port by a wire. Gadgets communicate with each other using wires like this. You'll also notice that a power port has appeared on the bottom of the sound effect gadget. To connect the two gadgets, just hover over that power port and press R2 or X. Time to head into play mode to see how it sounds. Oh, I just realised something. We got so caught up with these sound effects, we forgot to add another platform for Connie. She must be getting impatient. Sort that out for her. The easiest thing to do would be to clone the platform. Remember how to do that? Just hover over it, hold L1, and press and hold R2. Once the clone has been created, let go of L1, move it to the right spot, then release R2 to place it down. When you clone an object, any gadgets attached to it will come along for the ride. So all you need to do now is to wire the trigger zone on the second platform to the sound effect. Or even better, grab a new sound effect from the collection, just for variety. It's up to you. Dream Shapers should always go with their instincts. Whatever you choose to do, move on to the next step when you're ready.
All right, there's just one more gap for Connie to cross before she reaches the door. That pink cylinder would make a great stepping stone for her, but it's all the way down in the water. If you take a closer look at it, you'll see there's a trigger zone and a movement sensor on it. They're not connected to anything right now. There's also a keyframe on the platform. I wonder what that does. Try selecting it with X to find out. Just as I thought, it raises the cylinder so Connie can use it to cross over. Press the circle button to deselect the keyframe. Looks like all we need to do is connect the cylinder's trigger zone to the keyframe so it moves up when she gets close. And while we're doing that, why not add a sound effect to it as well? Let's jump back into the sound effects collection and see if there's anything appropriate in there. Down here, we've got some mechanical sound effect loops. These are the perfect sound effects for any sort of machinery in a scene. Hmm, we want something that would go well with a raising platform. I think I'll go for the heavy metal ratchet loop. That sounds good, right? Okay, now select the sound effect of your choice and stamp it near the pink cylinder with R2 or X. In the next step, I'll show you how to connect all of the gadgets. Now we just need to do a little bit of wiring to get everything working. Remember, the trigger zone will activate when it detects Connie, triggering the keyframe to raise the platform. Grab the detected output from the trigger zone with R2 or X. Then stretch the wire to the keyframe gadget and connect it to its power port with R2 or X. Now let's get the sound effect working. This will be triggered by the movement sensor. The movement sensor detects when the object it's attached to is moving. So when the platform starts rising, the movement sensor will send a signal from its output port. That's the output port on the right side of the movement sensor gadget. It's called Velocity Overall. Press R2 or X over the port to create a wire. You'll need to connect the other end of the wire to the sound effects power port. Once that's done, switch over to play mode to test everything out. So much better. That sound effect really makes a big difference. There's even more you can do to bring this scene to life. See if you can add some sound to the water between the platforms. I think there might be some water sounds in the tutorial collection. Experiment with the different effects as much as you like and see what you can come up with. When you're done, just take Connie through the door in play mode to finish this tutorial.
This tutorial is all about making music. Music can make your creations come alive, adding emotion and atmosphere. In Dreams, you can compose whole tracks from scratch and even make your own instruments. But you don't need to be a maestro to start making your own music. I'll show you how to create an arrangement using ready-made music clips. So let's begin. To start making music, we need to switch over to sound mode. Right now, you're in assembly mode. If you're ever unsure of what mode you're in, just hover over the icon in the top left corner to see your current mode and tool. Go to the assembly menu and open the modes menu with X. The modes menu is where you access all the different creation modes. Each mode has its own set of tools and options. The button for sound mode has a speaker symbol on it. Select it with X. Now you have a new menu at the top of the screen. This is the sound menu. It contains everything you need to make your own music. In the scene, you'll see a timeline gadget. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit it. Music in Dreams is arranged in timelines. This timeline contains a version of the music you heard at the start of this tutorial. To see what's inside it, we need to open its canvas. Hover your imp over the timeline, hold L1 and press X to open it. It's just like scoping into a group. This is the timeline canvas. The canvas exists within scene space, so if you pull down on the left stick, you'll back away from it. Hold the L1 button and use the left stick to move up and down the timeline. This is the best way to navigate around timelines, especially when they're big. This piece of music is called Connie's theme. To listen to it, just start time by clicking R3. See how the piece is composed of many music clips. The clips power on and off as the playhead passes over them. Click R3 again to pause time. Each music clip is a collection of notes made by an instrument. You can grab them and move them around with your imp. If you want to delete a music clip, hover over it and press the triangle button. Clips can also be cloned by holding L1 when you grab them. You can extend the timeline by hovering over one of its edges and holding X. The edge glows and an arrow icon appears. You can also extend the bottom if you need space for more clips. Once you've finished listening to the piece, click L3 to rewind time. You can find all sorts of different music by searching the Dreamiverse. To add music to one of your scenes, you could simply stamp a ready-made timeline, like this one. But in this tutorial, you'll learn how to assemble your own track from ready-made music clips. Move on to the next step and we'll get started. So, let's start making music. It's actually a lot easier than you might think. Close the timeline by selecting the cross button in the top right corner. Or hover over it, hold L1 and press circle to close it. Now delete the timeline by hovering over it with your imp and pressing triangle. Let's add a new music timeline to the scene. Press square to open the sound menu. Select the music timeline button in the menu then stamp one in the scene with R2 or X. Press circle to unequip the timeline gadget from your imp. 
Open up the timeline canvas with L1 and X. This timeline is empty, ready to be filled with music. The columns on the timeline represent musical bars. This timeline is eight bars long. We'll need more space than that, so hover over the right edge and grab it with X. Extend the timeline to 16 bars. Now let's add a music clip to the timeline. Press square to open the sound menu. Find the search button and select it with X. Its icon is the magnifying glass. When you search in sound mode, there are four options for finding different sounds. Select Search Music Clips with X. This is the Dreamiverse. Here you can find music made by other dream shapers. Well, usually you can, but for this tutorial, I've made a collection of elements for you to use. That's what this cluster is. Select it with X to open it. It contains a selection of music clips, which you can use to build your own arrangements. Use the right stick to zoom in and out, and the left stick to move around. I've grouped the clips into different categories. Let's start with a basic melody. That's this group of clips. Hover over the clips to hear a preview of how they sound. Find one that you like, then select it with X to equip it to your imp. I'm using the clip Nostalgia Bells. Your imp will now be holding a gadget containing your selected clip. If you hover over the timeline, the gadget should snap to the canvas and reveal the whole clip. Place the clip at the start of the timeline and stamp it with R2 or X. Clips on a timeline will snap to the bars and to other clips. This will help you line them up. Click R3 to listen to the timeline. In the next step, we'll build up the track with some more clips. Click L3 to rewind time. Let's build on the melody by adding some chords. Go to the sound menu and select Search Music Clips again. Over here are some chord clips. Hover over the clips to preview them, then select one with X. I'm going with Suspended Pad, but you can make your own choice. Stamp your clip onto a new row of the timeline and snap it to the start. Click R3 to listen and notice how the clips play together in time. Click L3 to rewind. Now let's add some drums. Go back to the sound menu and select Search Music Clips. Find the drum clips in the collection. A drum beat can really change the feel of a track. I love these samba practice drums. Pick a drum clip you like, then stamp it onto the timeline under the melody and chords. Now click R3 to listen to how it sounds. All the clips in the collection are in the same time and key, so you can mix and match them easily. Click L3 to rewind. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit the length of your clips and how to add fades.
When you hover over a clip on the timeline, you'll see dotted lines light up at the start and at the end of the clip. Move closer to the timeline so you can see them properly. These are trim handles. We can use them to change the length of a clip. Hover over the handle on the end of the drum clip, then hold R2 to grab it. These clips are loops, so you can extend the clip beyond its original length. All the clips in the collection can be extended in this way. Trim handles are really useful for arranging and remixing. They let you use just a section of a clip without having to edit the music notes inside. On top of the trim handle, you'll see a little coloured gizmo. Move in closer to see it properly. This is a fade handle. You can use it to fade the volume of a clip in or out. It works just like the trim handle. Grab the gizmo with R2 and move your imp left or right to create a fade. Try adding a fade out on the chord clip so it drops off gradually. Drag it out further for a longer fade. Now click R3 to run time. Doesn't that sound cool? You may have noticed that the music stops as soon as the playhead reaches the end of the timeline. In the next step, I'll show you how to make your timeline loop. Now click L3 to rewind. To make the track play constantly in the scene, we need to set the timeline to loop. We can do this in the Timelines Tweak menu. Hover over a blank area of the timeline, hold L1 and press Square to open its Tweak menu. In here we can change the timeline settings. Find the Playback Mode section. There are three options. Once means the timeline will play once all the way through when it's powered on. Sustain means the timeline will pause when it's powered off, then resume once it's powered on. Loop means the timeline will play repeatedly while it's powered on. Hover over the loop icon and press X to change the playback mode. You can also change the playback speed in the tweak menu. Hover over the playback speed slider and hold X to grab it. 
Now move your imp to the left or right to adjust the value. Click R3 to hear your adjustments live. You can also adjust the slider by hovering over it and pressing the up or down directional buttons. See how it sounds when it's slowed down or sped up a little. To close the tweak menu, hover over it, hold L1 and press circle. You can also tweak music clips to make them loop. Just hover over them, hold L1 and press square to open their tweak menus. You can also change their volume and tempo. Be careful changing the tempo, as your clips could go out of time with the others. We've made a cool piece of music, but you can carry on adding more clips if you want to. Maybe you heard something in a tutorial collection that would sound awesome in your arrangement. Try trimming and looping tracks. See what you can come up with. If you need extra space, you can extend the timeline by grabbing the edges with X. All the clips we've used in this tutorial come from the Media Molecule Music Collection. The collection contains lots of music clips you can use, as well as some complete tracks. Look for it in the Dreamiverse next time you're making music in sound mode. Once you've finished, switch over to play mode and listen to your track in the scene. To end the tutorial, just press Options and select the Exit Creation button.
Make the track play. If you've finished, switch over to play mode and listen to your track in the scene. To end the tutorial, just press Options and select the Exit Creation button. Are you ready to get those creative juices flowing? This tutorial's all about making your creations beautiful. Now, this is Connie's front garden. But what's this? It's had all the color, style, and magic sucked out of it. But not to worry, Connie. We can help make the garden pretty again with the power of dreams. Just to start you off, all the lighting's already done. We can learn more about that later. And because I'm ever your servant, I've also grouped some of these objects just for you. It'll make editing them quicker and easier. So what does the garden need? Well, it could do with some color, texture, and movement. Luckily, the coat, style, and effects modes are the perfect tools to do that. They don't create new objects. They modify existing sculptures and paintings. And they work on groups. With just a little practice, you can become a master of them all. So let's start by adding some color with the tint tool. Open the assembly menu with the square button and go to the modes menu. Each mode has its own set of tools and options. The tint tool is in coat mode. It has an icon that looks like a pot of paint being spilled. Select it by pressing the X button. As you can see, the assembly menu has now been replaced with the coat menu. In the top row, you'll find options and helpers. Along the bottom, you'll find the tools. Now, which color to use? Open the colors menu in the top row of icons. These are color groups. You can expand a color group with X. Each group contains more shades that you can choose from. I'm going to find a green for the foliage, but if green's not your thing, you can experiment. 
Is the menu too long? You can scroll it by grabbing it with R2. Pick a shade, or if you fancy a more painterly or organic look, choose the tumbler colour at the end of the group. That will apply a random shade that changes as you work. When you've chosen a colour, you're ready to go to the next step. To add colour to our scene, we'll use the Tint tool, which has an icon like an airbrush. You can manually select it in the Tools menu. But in Coat mode, choosing a colour from the Colours menu equips the Tint tool automatically. See the airbrush icon on the tip of your imp. The Tint tool recolors objects, either tinting or completely covering their original colour. Just press and hold R2 to tint the objects at the tip of your imp. No need to select or scope into anything. The rounded clumps look a bit dreary in this scene. Let's add some colour. You can see that the longer you hold R2, the stronger the tint gets. And with a tumbler colour selected, it will cycle through different shades. If you make a mistake, you can undo using the left directional button. Or set your tool to subtract and you can detint. How do you do that? If you press triangle while the tool is active, your imp will change to an outline. So now it will remove tint instead of adding it. And that works on pretty much all of the coat, style and effects tools. Just press triangle when they're equipped to make them subtractive. Try removing some colour using subtractive tint now. Just hold R2 over the object. And to make the tool additive again, press triangle. Now that you've got to grips with that, you can colour in the whole scene with the tint tool. Go wild! Use different colours to tint the path, rocks, river, grass, trees and the little cottage. The colours menu has all the colours you need. Just open a colour group and pick a shade or the tumbler colour. Take some time to colour your scene. When you're done, move on to the next step.
Good job. Now your scene is beautifully coloured in, let's add some texture to it. For that, we need to leave coat mode and go into style mode. To leave a mode, select the exit button in the top right of the screen. Or you can use a shortcut, hold L1 and press circle. Just like scoping out of a group. Now use the modes menu to switch over to style mode. The style mode icon is an S-shaped brush stroke. All sculptures and paintings in Dreams are made up of flex, and style mode is where we manipulate them. For example, notice how the objects in this scene look smooth. That's because their flex are small and tightly packed together. We can make them more textured with the Looseness tool. Select the Looseness tool. It looks like a blurry circle. Now try using R2 to loosen some of the foliage in the scene. Don't hold back. As you can see, loosening sculptures and paintings means their flex become more obvious. If you think they're getting too loose, press triangle to make the tool subtractive and tighten them up again with R2. Or you can just use the left directional button to undo. Don't forget to loosen up the river too. We'll need it in the following steps. Carry on loosening the objects in the scene. When you're happy, Proceed to the next step. Wonderful! Connie's garden looks like a lovely painting. Let's look at the water now. Water has a reflective quality, so let's add some shine to the river. This is where the finish tool comes in. Exit out of style mode with L1 and circle and head back into coat mode in the modes menu. Next to the colors menu in coat mode, you'll find the finishes menu. Select it with X. These finishes change the way objects react to light in your scene. Using finishes, you can make objects shiny, rough, metallic, or even translucent. Now you can choose your finish for the river. Let's see. Ah, yes. How about shiny wax? Wax finishes are translucent, and the shine will give the river a reflective surface that will catch the light. Apply the finish as before using R2. Remember that you can revert your changes by switching to subtractive mode with triangle or by using undo. Try editing the finish on other groups and objects in the scene. Continue to the next step when you're ready. Our river looks nice and shiny now, but something's missing. It doesn't flow like water does. But there's a magical tool for that in effects mode. It's called the flow tool. Leave coat mode if you haven't already and enter effects mode. The effects mode icon has some twinkly stars on it. 
Alongside the flow tool, you'll notice other animated effects that you can apply to sculptures or paintings. But for now, we'll pick the flow tool. Its icon is a tap, or a faucet if you're from the US. Press X over the flow tool to select it. And use R2 to apply it to the river. Isn't that lovely? In effects mode, you can preview the flow effect even when time is paused. But if you leave effects mode, you'll need to click R3 to see the effects in action. When the river's flowing at the right speed, you may notice something a bit odd. It's flowing the wrong way. Let's fix that using another tool found in style mode, the comb tool. Leave effects mode using L1 and circle, then go back into style mode via the modes menu. The comb tool icon is some wavy lines. Select it with X. Now we're gonna make the river flow the correct way. How do we do that? You guessed it. Hold R2 to comb the flecks of the river so they go in the right direction. We're no longer in effects mode, so we can't see the flow effect animating. But just click R3 to start time, and you'll be able to see it again. The key is to move your imp in the direction you'd like the flex to flow. A bit like you're combing the river's hair. Very stylish. Let go of R2 when you're happy with the flow direction. And now you can see the river is going the correct way. But if it isn't, just undo and try again. When you're happy with the speed and direction of the river, click L3 to rewind time. Then it's off to the next step.
When you're happy with the speed and direction of the river, you'd like the flex to flow. A bit like you're combing the river's hair. Very stylish. Let go of R2 when you're happy with the flow direction. And now you can see the river is going the correct way. But if it isn't, just undo and try again. When you're happy with the speed and direction of the river, click L3 to rewind time. Then it's off to the next step. This scene is really coming together. Next, let's do something interesting with the chimney smoke. Move closer to the smoke so you can see the flex clearly. These flex don't look very smoky, do they? Let's change that. If you're not already in style mode, head there now using the modes menu. Open the flex menu with X. It's the button in the center of the top row. Now choose a fleck that looks smoky. How about the dots fleck? When you choose a fleck type, it'll automatically select the apply fleck tool. Now, hover your imp over the smoke and hold R2. The flex will change. That's better. Let's inspect it now using the grab cam. Grab it with R1. And while you're grabbing, spin around it with the left or right stick. The paint strokes look a bit flat, don't they? You can only see them well from certain angles. We can make it a bit more billowy and three-dimensional using the impasto tool. In the style menu, select the impasto tool, then hold R2 to apply it to the smoke. Watch as the individual flecks of the painting become more three-dimensional. To see it better, use the grab cam to spin around the smoke again. You can also press undo and redo to compare the smoke with and without impasto. Now that you've mastered impasto, the last style tool we're gonna use is the ruffle tool. The ruffle tool icon looks like a lot of lines going in different directions. It will randomly rotate the flex so they're not as orderly. It works in the same way as the other two tools. Select it with X, then use R2 to apply it. And switch the tool to subtractive by pressing triangle. Ruffle makes quite a difference, doesn't it? Why not see if you can animate the smoke using the flow tool in effects mode? When you're happy, go to the next step of the tutorial.
Now that the scene is looking good, we should make Connie's cottage look more well. Now that the scene is looking good. Now that the scene. Now that the. Now that the scene is. Now that the scene is looking good. This. Move close. Very smoky, do they? Let's change. Open the flex menu with X. It's the button in the center of the top row. Now choose a flex that looks smoky. How about we select the apply flex tool? Now hover your imp over the smoke and hold R2. The flex will change. That's better. Let's inspect it now using the grab cam from certain angles. We can make it a bit more billowy and three-dimensional using the impasto tool. In the style menu, select the impasto tool, then hold R2 to apply it to the smoke. Watch as the individual flex of the painting become more three-dimensional. To see it better, use the grab cam to spin around the smoke again. You can also press undo and redo to compare the smoke with and without impasto. Now that you've mastered impasto, the last style tool we're going to use is the ruffle tool. The ruffle tool icon looks like a lot of lines going in different directions. It will randomly rotate the flex so they're not as orderly. It works in the same way as the other two tools. Select it with X, then use R2 to apply it. And switch the tool to subtractive by pressing triangle. Ruffle makes quite a difference, doesn't it? Why not see if you can animate the smoke using the flow tool in effects mode? When you're happy, go to the next step of the tutorial. Now that the scene is looking good, we should make Connie's cottage look more welcoming for her. We can do that using something called the glow tool. So head back to the modes menu and into coat mode. The glow tool has an icon that looks like a little sun. Select it with X. Then move your view over to the cottage for a closer look. Now position your view so that you can see the door and the window of the cottage. Then hold R2 over the window in the door to make it glow. Go on, give it some welly. Whoa, that's too bright. Let's press triangle to make the tool subtractive. Then use R2 to reduce the glow. Maybe you could try tinting the window to change the color of the light. See what you think. Have a play with the glow tool and then move on to the next step when you're ready. The scene looks so alive now and Connie's in love with her new home.
It's hard to believe that this scene used to be all grey and blocky. Let's try something. How different did we actually make it? To see, we can use a special trick. Press square to open the menu and then take a look in the show hide section. The show hide icon looks like an open eye. It can be found in most of the modes menus. In the show hide menu, you can make all sorts of different objects visible or invisible. It only works in edit mode, so your scene will still look the same in play mode. Some of them are on by default and some are switched off. Coat, style and effects is one of the options which is on by default. Its icon is a combination of the icons for all three of those modes. Try turning it off by pressing X over it. Wow, what an amazing difference. That shows you how powerful these tools really are. Using coat, style and effects, you can make even the most boring block come alive. Practice using the tools and see what you can come up with. When you're finished, go to play mode in the options menu and walk Connie into her beautiful new home. This will complete the tutorial. In this lesson, I'll show you how to sculpt your own objects from scratch, which will come in handy because Cuthbert's having a meltdown. Again. Fortunately, we can use the tools in sculpt mode to help get Connie to Cuthbert and escort him to safety. Go to the assembly menu, press the square button to open it if it's closed, and select the modes menu with the X button. Select Sculpt Mode with X. Its icon has some 3D shapes on it. Every time you enter Sculpt Mode from the Modes menu, a new sculpture will be created. You'll also notice that when you're in Sculpt Mode, everything outside the sculpture will be blurred and greyed out. This is to help you focus on what you're creating. You can adjust visual feedback in your preferences, which you can find in the Options menu. When you first enter Sculpt Mode, the Shapes menu will open automatically and the Smear Shape tool will be equipped to your imp. Try smearing a shape now by holding R2 and moving your imp around. It's great for making organic forms. Now that's out of your system, undo all of it by using the left directional button. By using this tool, we'll help Connie get across the first gap. Move your view a bit closer to the action, looking side on at the space between the platforms. Make sure you can see the platforms and that your imp can reach them. We want to build an organic structure for Connie to walk on, so let's pick an appropriate shape. Select one from the Shapes menu, and you'll see it on the end of your imp. Use the up and down directional buttons to scale it to an appropriate size. While you have a shape on your imp, you can use the grab cam to zoom in and out. Just hold R1 and use the left stick. Now position your imp next to the platform on one side of the gap. Then hold down R2 and use the motion sensor function or the left stick to smear your shape in the gap so that Connie can walk on it. If you want to have another go at it, 
Just undo using the left directional button. Feel free to press and let go of R2 as many times as you want. Each press will create a new edit within your sculpture. Bear in mind that all the edits you make are part of a single sculpture, even if they aren't connected. This means that in assembly mode, they'll behave like a single object. Why not try out different shapes to see what works best? Try holding L2 as you sculpt and use the left and right sticks to rotate the shape. Maybe try making something like a rock formation or a tree trunk. The cool thing is, sculpts are automatically physical, so they can be walked on by puppets like Connie immediately. When you want to try it out, switch to play mode in the options menu and get Connie to walk around on your sculpture. When you're happy to move on, go back to edit mode and proceed to the next step. What happens when we want to edit an existing sculpture rather than start a new one? Let's investigate. When we went into play mode, we were taken out of sculpt mode. When you're in assembly mode, scope back into your sculpture. Hover over it with your imp, hold L1 and press X. It's just like scoping into a group. Have a go at it now. Now we're here, let's try editing the shapes you've already made. To move or rotate shapes, Unequip the Smear Shape tool by pressing circle. This automatically equips the Move tool. You might notice most of the movement controls in Sculpt mode are the same as in Assembly mode. Grab and move shapes with R2, rotate them using L2 and the sticks or the touchpad. You can hold L1 and move with R2 to clone your shapes or scale them with the up and down buttons. You can even repeat clone. But unlike assembly mode, you can't select things with X in sculpt mode. Now try moving, rotating and scaling your individual shapes. If you want to smear some shapes again, just go to the Sculpt Tools menu and select the Smear Shape tool. The icon is a row of intersecting squares. Now you can play around at sculpting with different shapes. Don't forget that you can undo and redo at any time. If you accidentally scope out, you can scope back into your sculpture by hovering over it with your imp and pressing L1 and X. In the next step, I'll show you how to color your sculpture. You've probably noticed by now that all your sculptures are orangey-brown, like clay. That's the default colour, but you can sculpt with any colour you like. If you're in assembly mode, hover over your sculpture with your imp, then hold L1 and press X to scope back into it. 
Next, head to the colour section in the Sculpt menu and press X over a colour group to see the different shades. Choose a colour, any one you like. And as if by magic, the shape on your imp is now the colour you chose. Any new shapes you make will be that colour, but the old shapes are still brown. Luckily, we can also colour shapes after we've created them using the spray paint tool. Go to the Sculpt menu and open the Tools section with X. Then select the Spray Paint tool, which has a spray can icon. Now your imp will have an outline of the current shape on its tip. Intersect the shape with your sculpture and you'll see the spray paint colour appear on it. Hold R2 to apply the spray paint to the shapes. You can try out different colours and shapes to completely change the look of your sculpture. If you want to make it easier to keep your imp on the surface of the sculpture, you can use the Surface Snap Guide. You can find Surface Snap in the Sculpt Guides menu. Select it with X to turn it on. There's a Guides menu in every mode, though not all guides are available everywhere. You can also change the finish of your sculpture using the Finishes menu. The Coat, Style and Effects tutorial has more on finishes if you're curious. By now, you should have an organic looking form and it will be whatever colour your imagination conjured up. If you switched on Surface Snap, switch it off in the Guides menu before continuing. Just select the button with X to turn it off. Then, when you're ready, proceed to the next step. All these smeared shapes are creating one single sculpture even if there's space between them. But you can also use the smear tool to remove from the sculpture instead of adding to it. To do that, we need to make the tool subtractive. Scope into your sculpture if you haven't already with L1 and X. When the Smear Shape tool is equipped to your imp, you can press Triangle to make it subtractive. You'll notice that your imp turns into an outline. The shape on your imp becomes an outline too. You can now use the Smear tool to cut into your sculpture. Try using different shapes to see what effect they have. For a really cool effect, try subtracting with a different coloured shape on your imp. How good is that? You can switch the tool between additive and subtractive by pressing triangle. Why not play around with the tools a bit and try to make a dramatic or interesting looking form? When you're happy with its shape, go into play mode and see if you can get Connie across it. If you need to edit it, just come back to edit mode via the options menu. Don't forget to scope back into your sculpture using L1 and X. When Connie has successfully crossed the first gap in play mode, switch back to edit mode, then go to the next step.
Smearing shapes can be a messy business. Sometimes you just want to create neat sculptures. Luckily, there are ways to do that. So go to the assembly menu and select Sculpt in the modes menu. This will create a new sculpture. Now let's practice sculpting an architectural structure over the second gap. To help us build a neater bridge, open the Guides section of the Sculpt menu. In Guides, switch on Grid Snap by pressing X over it. You'll see a number appear next to the button. That's how big the grid squares will be. You'll notice the white dotted grid in the scene. The spacing of the dots shows the tightness of the grid. They will change orientation depending on your point of view. We'll leave it on the default setting for now. You can experiment with it later. Now try making a colourful sculpture using the Smear and Move tools and the Colours menu. This will just be a practice one, so don't spend too long on it. We'll delete it and make an even better one in a minute. You'll notice that it's much easier to keep your shapes neat and straight this time. That's because Grid Snap is active. It makes your tools and objects snap to the grid. It also helps you rotate precisely. Try it out using L2 or the touchpad. With Grid Snap on, objects rotate 45 degrees at a time. You can rotate the shape on the end of your imp before you stamp it or use the Move tool to rotate shapes that are already placed. When you're comfortable sculpting with Grid Snap, continue to the next step. If we want to make a super neat bridge, there's another guide we can use. If you're still in sculpt mode, scope out of it with L1 and circle. Once you're in assembly mode, delete your sculpture with triangle. Go to the Modes menu. Click the Sculpt Mode button to start a new sculpture. Now we're in Sculpt Mode, the Guides menu will have different options. Open the Guides menu and switch on the Mirror Guide. Don't worry about the two additional options, let's investigate them later. Also, check the Grid Snap is still turned on. Now select the smear tool in your chosen colour and shape. The mirror guide will always centre on the first shape you make. That's why we started a new sculpture. Now move your view so you can see all of the second gap and your imp can reach it. If you need to, use the grab cam to zoom out a little from the shape on your imp. Now stamp your first shape right in the centre of the gap to enable the mirror guide. Then smear your shape from the centre over to the edge of the gap where it meets the platform. You'll see that your sculpt is mirrored, so you only have to make half of the bridge and it will be nice and symmetrical leaving you to focus on making it fabulous. Carry on sculpting and carving your bridge until you're happy.
test it in play mode. And when Connie is over the second gap, return to edit mode via the options menu. When you're back in edit mode, switch off the mirror guide. You can also switch off grid snap. When you're back, return. You only have to make half of the then smear your shape from the center over to the edge of the gap where it meets the platform. You'll see that your sculpt is mirrored, so you only have to make half of the bridge and it'll be nice and symmetrical, leaving you to focus on making it fabulous. Carry on sculpting and carving your bridge until you're happy. Test it in play mode. And when Connie is over the second gap, return to edit mode via the options menu. When you're back in edit mode, switch off the mirror guide. You can also switch off grid snap if you want, before moving on to the next step. Now we need to create a bridge across the last gap. For that, we're going to use the mighty stamp tool. First we'll need to create a new sculpture by going to Sculpt Mode via the Modes menu. Now that you're in Sculpt Mode, make sure you've switched off the Mirror Guide before you continue. You'll be equipped with the Smear Shape tool by default, so you'll need to switch to the Stamp Shape tool. You can find Stamp Shape in the Sculpt Mode Tools menu, next to Smear Shape. Its icon is a simple square. You can quickly switch between the Stamp and Smear tools using L1 and Triangle. It's a bit like switching between Additive and Subtractive, but with L1 held down. Stamping shapes is a bit like stamping objects from the Dreamiverse. With the Stamp Shape tool, you only stamp one shape at a time, no matter how long you hold R2 or X. This has additional benefits too, which you'll see later. Now select the cube in the Shapes menu, then stamp one at the side of the gap. We're almost there, Connie! Open the Sculpt Tools menu again, and this time pick the Stretch tool. Its icon is a double-ended arrow. When Stretch is selected, hovering your imp over a shape will cause an arrow gizmo to appear. Hover over the side of the cube that's facing the opposite platform. Press and hold R2 when the arrow is showing, and use your imp to stretch the shape across the gap. Nice. Let go of R2 when you're done stretching. It's not a very exciting bridge right now, but I've got something great to customize it with soon. You can stretch any shape you've sculpted, regardless of what shape it is. Spheres, cones, and even donuts can be stretched. You can even stretch subtractive shapes, but only at the points where they intersect with the sculpture. Have some fun with the stretch tool, but don't go to play mode just yet. When you're ready to take this bridge and your sculpting skills to the next level, continue to the final step.
So far, I've shown you a few ways to edit the shapes you've already sculpted. But there's also a way to edit the shape before stamping or smearing. First of all, make sure you're still scoped into the sculpture. If not, hover over the bridge, hold L1 and press X to scope in. Also, make sure that you're using the stamp shape tool and not the smear shape. Next, choose a shape from the Shapes menu and select what colour you want it to be. Now move the new shape right next to the bridge so that they're touching. Use the Grab Cam to make sure the shape is in contact with your bridge. Now hold L1 and press Square to open the Shape Editor, just like when you want to tweak something. When you're in the Shape Editor, you can let go of L1 and the shape will be fixed in place while editing. Notice the Sculpt menu has been replaced with the Shape Editor menu. The buttons vary a little depending on which tool and shape you're using. The Shape Editor for the Stamp tool has quite a few options. We're only interested in one for now, the most exciting Your bridge. Now hold L1 and press square to open the shape editor, just like when you want to tweak something. When you're in the shape editor, you can let go of L1 and the shape will be fixed in place while editing. Notice the sculpt menu has been replaced with the shape editor menu. The buttons vary a little depending on which tool and shape you're using. The shape editor for the stamp tool has quite a few options. We're only interested in one for now, the most exciting one, Soft Blend. The icon is the one with the two circles blending together. If the option isn't there, just check that you have the stamp shape tool equipped and not smear shape. This is important. Next to the icon, there's a slider and a toggle button. Sliders in the shape editor are round, which may seem unusual, but they work just like the sliders in tweak menus. The blend amount slider affects how much the shape will blend with other shapes nearby. Try holding X on the slider and moving your imp up and down. This is how you get some truly amazing shapes. The Hard Blend toggle switches between Hard and Soft Blends. Toggle between the two options with X to see the difference it makes. To close the Shape Editor, just press Circle. Now have a play with your blendable shape. You can only blend shapes that are part of the same sculpture, so if you can't see any blending on your shape, Scope into the sculpture with L1 and X. You can make some very cool shapes using blending. Try making subtractive blends too. Experiment with different shapes and blends on your bridge. Make it really fancy. You can jump back into the shape editor with L1 and Square. You can use the Shape Editor in any of the sculpting tools. Try using Soft Blend with the Spray Paint tool. To exit the Shape Editor and return to sculpting, just press Circle. When you've got the hang of the Shape Editor and you're happy with your bridge, try it out in Play Mode and get Connie to Cuthbert. Take Connie through the door to finish the tutorial.
In this tutorial, we'll master paint mode. Uh-oh. Looks like Connie's having a bad day. Cuthbert got a bit handy with the lawnmower and mucked up her garden. Sorry, Connie. Let's paint her a lovely new one in paint mode. So, to explain, everything you see in dreams is made up of little splats called flecks. They can be big, loose and painterly, or small, tight and smooth. In paint mode, we deal with strokes, like real-life painting. Strokes are lines of flecks that you draw in 3D space using your imp. Let's make some now. Go to the assembly menu. If it's closed, just press the square button to open it. Then open the modes menu with X. It's this little group of icons. In the modes menu, select paint mode. It has an icon with a paint squiggle. When you enter paint mode, you'll go straight into the flex menu. And the brush flex tool will be equipped to your imp. See? There's a fleck on the tip of your imp. When you're painting, everything else goes blurry and black and white to help you focus on what you're creating. You can adjust the visual feedback in your preferences, which you can find in the options menu. Try pressing and holding R2 while you move your imp around. And look at that! You're painting! Your imp creates a paint stroke made of a trail of flex. Try changing how hard you press R2 as you paint. With the brush flex tool, changing the pressure on R2 affects how opaque the flex are. So if you press R2 lightly, the flex will be more transparent. Now press square to open the paint menu so that we can look at some new colours and finishes. Look at the top row of buttons in the paint menu to find them. As well as the flex menu, which is already open, there are also menus for colours and finishes there. You can use these to change the colour and finish of your flex. Practice with the brush flex tool and make as many strokes as you like. You can always undo any mistakes with the left directional button. Once you've got a feel for painting, continue to the next step. Was that fun? Now that you've made a gorgeous painting, hold L1 and press circle to scope out of paint mode. It's just like scoping out of a group and works the same way for all creation modes. A painting is a single object created in paint mode, just like a sculpture is a single object created in sculpt mode. In assembly mode, you can move, scale and rotate your painting. To edit the strokes in the painting, you can scope into it, just like you can with a group. Try scoping into the painting you just made. Hover over it, hold L1, then press X to scope in. When you scope into a painting, you will automatically be put back into paint mode and equipped with the brush fleck tool. Press circle to unequip the brush fleck tool. Now you can use the Move tool on the individual strokes in the painting. You can scope out of the painting again with L1 and Circle. Do you fancy making some flowers for Connie's garden? Connie loves flowers. Let's start by making a leaf and then we can work our way up to the petals. Delete your practice painting using Triangle. Then enter paint mode in the modes menu. Choose a colour and a finish from the paint menu. Then choose a fleck to paint with. 
Use the up and down directional buttons to adjust the size of the fleck. Now paint a simple stroke. Remember, the harder you press, the more opaque the flex will be. If you want to take another shot at it, just undo with the left directional button and try again. When you're happy with your leaf, go to the next step. Next, let's paint a stalk. In the context menu, you'll see a button with a plus sign icon. Select this button to start a new painting. For the stalk, we'll use the Draw Flex tool. Open the paint menu with square if it's closed, then select the Tools menu. The Draw Flex tool icon is a pencil. Select it with X. DrawFlex acts more like a pen than a paintbrush. The harder you press R2, the larger the stroke gets. So if you press gently, the stroke will be quite small. When you scale the DrawFlex tool, the fleck will get much bigger. That's because it's showing you the maximum size of the fleck. When you stop scaling, it reverts back to the smallest size the fleck can be. Try drawing a flower stalk with it. Have a few goes to practice. Adjust the pressure on R2 as you paint the stroke, so that the stalk tapers at the end. Don't worry about lining it up with the leaf, though. We'll do that later. When you're happy with your stalk, continue to the next step. Now the exciting bit, the flower. In the context menu, select the Start New Painting button. By starting a new painting, the flower will be a separate object to the stalk. We're going to paint the petals with the Stamp Flex tool plus a special ingredient. You can find Stamp Flex in the Paint Mode Tools menu. Select it with X, then choose a fleck, colour and finish for your flower's petals. Now for that special ingredient. The Kaleidoscope Guide. 
You can find Kaleidoscope in the Guides menu, which is in the top row of the Paint menu. The Kaleidoscope icon looks like a snowflake. Select it with X to turn it on. Leave the settings as they are for now. You can experiment with them later. You'll now have a clump of five flecks on your imp. Stamp the clump in your scene. That will set the center of the kaleidoscope. There will now be one fleck on your imp and four others floating around the center point. Whatever you do with the fleck on your imp will be mirrored by the other four. You might need to adjust your position to get a good view. You could also try rotating the fleck on your imp. To do that, hold L2 and use the sticks, or stroke the touchpad. You can use the up and down directional buttons to scale the flex. Whatever you do, make a flower you like the look of. If you mess up, you can just undo it with the left directional button and try again. Add as many petals as you like. Try using different colors and sizes. You could also try using the other painting techniques you've learned. If you want to delete parts of the bloom, just unequip the Stamp Flex tool by pressing Circle. Then use Triangle to delete any parts you don't like. If you delete the first flex you stamped, the Kaleidoscope Guide will still be centered on their position. With the Move tool equipped, you can also move or even clone parts of the painting. Flex created with the Kaleidoscope Guide will always behave like a kaleidoscope, even when the guide is turned off. Go ahead and experiment. Then, when you're happy, proceed to the next step. Now we've finished painting, unequip the Stamp Fleck tool with Circle. And if it's still on, turn off Kaleidoscope in the Guides menu too. Scope out of the painting by holding L1 and pressing Circle. Now you can assemble the parts of the flower using the Move tool. Beautiful! Let's group the flower so it's a single object. Select all of the flower parts with X. And now select the Group button in the Context menu. There! We've made the flower a single group that we can move, scale, rotate and clone. Hmm, I spy some charming plant pots. How about we put the flower in one of them? Now let's make another flower by cloning the first one. So hold L1, then grab the flower with R2 to make a clone. We don't want them all to look identical though. Let's make a different bloom. You can scope into the flower group by holding L1 and pressing X over it. Scope into the Now let's make Spice, we've made the flower parts. Now you can assemble the parts of the flower using the Move tool. Beautiful! Let's group the flower so it's a single object. Select all of the flower parts with X. And now select the Group button in the Context menu. There! We've made the flower a single group that we can move, scale, rotate and clone. 
Hmm, I spy some charming plant pots. How about we put the flower in one of them? Now let's make another flower by cloning the first one. So hold L1, then grab the flower with R2 to make a clone. We don't want them all to look identical though. Let's make a different bloom. You can scope into the flower group by holding L1 and pressing X over it. Now delete the bloom from the top of the plant. Let's do something a bit different with this flower. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit the appearance of your flex. So, let's make a beautiful new bloom for this flower. Enter paint mode and equip the stamp flex tool. To make this bloom look a little different, we're going to edit the flex appearance. We can do that by selecting the edit flex button in the context menu. Or use the shortcut. Hold L1 and press square to open the Fleck Editor. It's the same shortcut as opening a tweak menu. The Fleck Editor has sliders for altering the appearance of the Fleck. They look a bit different to the sliders you see in tweak menus, but they work much the same way. Try dragging them up and down using X and see what they do to the fleck on your imp. How exciting! The fade slider... adds extra flex that fade away near the edges. The scatter slider adds extra flex with impasto to create a more three-dimensional clump of flex. The opacity slider makes the flex more transparent. Once you've adjusted the sliders to your liking, simply press circle to exit the flex editor and start painting with your fleck. Now create a new bloom for the flower. Perhaps try turning on Kaleidoscope again. When you're finished, Exit the painting by pressing L1 and circle. Move the new bloom onto the stalk and then scope out of the group with L1 and circle. When you're done, move on to the next step.
Now we have some new flowers, how about a bit of rain to water them? We can do that by creating an animated stroke. Make sure you're scoped out of any paintings or groups. Then select Paint Mode from the Modes menu. For the rain, we'll use the Rule Flex tool. It's in the Paint Mode Tools menu. The icon looks like a ruler. The Rule Flex tool lets you draw straight lines made of flex. Choose a fleck, colour and finish for your rain. Something watery. Then close the menu with square. These flecks are going to be raindrops, so make them small using the down directional button. Move your view back from the flowers so that you can see plenty of space above them. Then position your imp at a reasonable distance above the flowers and press and hold R2. Stretch the stroke down to the grass at a slight angle, then release R2 to stamp it. This line of flex is going to be the path of the raindrop. Unequip the Rule Flex tool with Circle, then scope out of your painting using L1 and Circle. It doesn't look like much at the moment, but in the next step, I'll show you how to make it look more... rainy. To animate the painting, we need to tweak it. So hover your imp over the painting you just made. Hold L1 and press square to open its tweak menu. Look for the animation page of the tweak menu. The tab has a clapperboard icon. The slider at the top controls the playback speed. Grab the slider with X and pull it to the right. You won't see anything change to start with. In order to see animation, you'll need to start time by clicking R3. Use the grab cam or the sticks to get up close to the stroke and you'll see the flex are moving along it. You can increase the playback speed to make them move faster. The next step is to switch on pulse. When pulse is on, you won't see the whole stroke. Instead, a pulse of flex will travel down it. Select the pulse button in the animation tab of the tweak menu. Its icon is a bomb. Ah yes, that looks much more like a raindrop. You can shorten the trail of the pulse using the slider below the pulse button. Shorten the trail a little to achieve a raindrop look. Hmm, the drops are still a little on the slow side. Grab the playback speed slider and turn it right up. That's more like it. One raindrop isn't going to water many flowers though. There's a handy way to duplicate your painting without having to clone it loads of times. I'll show you in the next step. So now let's duplicate our raindrop and create a proper downpour. In the tweak menu of the raindrop painting, look for the duplicates tab. The duplicates icon is a pair of sheep, just like the clone tool. This tab is used to create duplicates automatically, based on a variety of options. The positional duplicates options determine where the copies appear. The option we want is a round camera. Select it and see what happens. Wow, now it looks like it's really raining. This setting duplicates the painting around the camera automatically, so wherever we go in the scene, 
it will seem like it's raining. At the bottom of the duplicates tab are three sliders. They affect how many of them there are, how far apart the duplicates are spaced, and whether they are scaled randomly. Try adjusting the sliders and see if you can create an effect you like. Then close the tweak menu using the close button in the corner or hold L1 and press circle over the tweak menu to close it. Now that we've watered the garden, let's add some finishing touches. Open the assembly menu with square, then select the search button with X. The collection for this tutorial, square, then select the search button with X. The collection for this tutorial, contains lots of great things made in paint mode. There are also more plant pots and a garden shed made in sculpt mode. Use the collection to finish making Connie's garden. Stamp some plants or pots or paint more plants of your own. Make it lovely. When you're happy with the garden, stamp the shed in there somewhere. To finish the tutorial, switch over to play mode and walk Connie through the door of the shed.